And without further ado, please welcome Director of National Planetarium, Mrs. Andrina Ahmad, to give her welcoming remark. To our celebrated speaker today, Professor Dr. Dame Josephine Bell. Welcome to Malaysia and my appreciation to all our distinguished guests for spending your busy hours with us today to attend this valuable public talk. I would also like to express regret for your inconvenience today as the National Planetarium is currently under construction for exhibit upgrading purpose. All of you are welcome to visit when the new exhibit gallery is ready in May. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Angkasa is very pleased to let you know that how grateful we are to work with the British High Commission in organizing the public talk today. The main intention of this talk is to promote the International Year of Astronomy 2009 and space science among students, public and young generations. The International Astronomy Union, IAU, has launched 2009 as the International Year of Astronomy under the theme, The Universe Yours to Discover. It will be a global celebration of astronomy and its contributions to society and culture with a strong emphasis on education, public engagement, and involvement of young people with events at national, regional, and global levels throughout the whole of 2009. It is hoped that by means of this international program, general public will be inspired to appreciate and understand the importance of knowledge on outer space, astronomy, and its potentials, the technology needed to be developed, and the benefits that we could gain from this program. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Susan Jocelyn Bell was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland on July 15, 1943. Professor Dr. Dean Jocelyn is currently a visiting professor of astrophysics at the University of Oxford. She received her PhD in radio astronomy from Cambridge University in 1968. Since leaving Cambridge, Dr. Bell Bernal studied the sky in almost every region of the electromagnetic spectrum. She received many honors and awards for contribution in science. In June 2007, she was awarded a DBE, the equivalent to male knighthood, which carries the title name. To audience, please enjoy the talk titled, You Are Made of Star Stuff, and hope it would in turn benefit all of us in many ways. Thank you so much. So from the University of Glasgow with a Bachelor of Science Physics in 1965 and received her PhD from New Hall, renamed Murray Edward College of the University of Cambridge in 1969. After finishing her PhD, Belle Bernard worked at the University of Southampton, University College London and Royal Observatory Edinburgh. In addition, from 1973 to 1987, she was also a tutor, consultant, examiner, and lecturer for the Open University. In 1991, she was appointed Professor of Physics at the Open University, a position she held for 10 years. She was also a visiting professor at Princeton University. Before retiring, Belle Bernard was Dean of Science at the University of Bath between 2001 and 2004 and was President of the Royal Astronomical Society between 2002 and 2004. She is currently Visiting Professor of Astrophysics at the University of Oxford and Fellow of Mansfield College. She is the current president in the Institute of Physics. And without further ado, please welcome Prof. Dr. Dame Jocelyn Bell to give her talk. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished visitors, students, thank you for being here. Thank you to ANCASA 
and the planetarium for hosting this talk. And thank you to the British High Commission in Singapore, which has made this visit possible. I have happy memories of an earlier visit to Malaysia, which included Kuching and Penang, as well as here to the planetarium. It is very good to be back again. Thank you. I want to talk this morning about how we are made of star stuff, material from the stars. the ones that are important for us, for our lives. Then I will talk about the origins of the universe, the Big Bang. I will talk about how the stars create the elements, about how stars die, and how stars and planets and people are made. So first, the chemical elements. Here are some answers by American students to some questions about the elements. The first answer says, H2O is hot water and CO2 is cold water. But you know that is not correct. What is cold water? H2O, yes. What does the H stand for? And the O? Good, we have two elements already. CO2, what is that? Yep, so we have carbon as well. We now have three elements. Here's another American answer, even more elaborate. <laughs> it is brilliantly creative, even if it is wrong. <laughs> I expect you've seen charts like this, maybe in school laboratories, yes. This is a list of all the chemical elements, and there are about a hundred of them, all the way from hydrogen, through helium, through lithium, beryllium, or carbon <laughs> Many, many elements. Given that there are about a hundred of them, I cannot talk about them all today. So I am going to pay attention to the chemical elements that we need in our bodies. So stop and think a moment about what chemical elements are in your bodies. We have water in our bodies, so there is hydrogen and oxygen. We have carbon and oxygen and hydrogen in many of the tissues in our bodies. Is there calcium in your body? Bones, yes. Bones are calcium carbonate. So I'll also focus on carbon. Iron. In your blood, the red hemoglobin that contains iron. And if you do not have enough iron, you are in trouble. And then there are trace elements of other chemical elements. There are some little bits of... <laughs> little bits of potassium and lithium and elements like that. But I'm going to concentrate today particularly on hydrogen, oxygen, calcium, carbon, and iron as being the elements that are most important for us. 
Now I'm going to go and talk astronomy. I could have done the talk a different way. I could have talked about how we grow from birth to adulthood, how we grow because we eat food, we absorb chemicals through our food and through our water. And then you could ask, where do those chemicals come from? They come from the food, and the plants get it from the earth, and where does the earth get it from? And we could work backwards okay. from now. But I think it is simpler to make a big jump, right back to the beginning, and then describe how the universe evolved to bring us here today. So I'm now going to make a mega jump back to 13.7 billion years ago. Because we believe that 13.7 billion years ago, and I'm using billion in the American sense, 1,000 million, we believe that shortly before this Big Bang, everything in the universe was in a very, very small ball smaller than a grain of sand and there was a rapid explosion expansion and that is what we call the big bang it was originally a name a nickname but it has stuck and it is now the official name and you spell it with capital b's the big bang so at the time of the Big Bang, everything that was in this tiny, tiny ball rapidly expanded out. And it was very energetic, and there was a fireball, a ball of energy. Very hot, but expanding and cooling as it expanded. The earliest temperature is 10 to the power 33 degrees, a thousand million, 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 million degrees. Have we some physics students in the audience? Uh -huh. Do you see anything wrong with that statement? No? <laughs> degrees what? Well, maybe. I haven't said, have I? No, that's my mistake. Degrees Kelvin, probably. But it is such a big number, it does not really matter which kind of degrees it is. But as a good physicist, you should always say, whether it's degrees Celsius, degrees Kelvin, absolute Fahrenheit, Reamer, degrees Ancasa, whatever. <laughs> So this ball of fire continues to expand and cool, and after about one second, the temperature of the fireball is down to about 10 billion degrees, 10 to the power 10 degrees. And the fireball size is a little bit bigger than the size of the solar system. But it is still all light and radiation. However, as it cools, Einstein's famous equation begins to take action. Do you know of the equation E equals mc squared? You do? Great. Yep. That equation tells you that you can change energy into matter, or matter into energy. And this equation tells you how much matter you get for each bit of energy, and vice versa. It's a bit like changing currencies. I came last night from Bangkok to Kuala Lumpur. I had to change my Thai bats into Malaysian ringgits. This equation is about changing energy into mass, just like changing currency. So after a few minutes, this equation starts operating and some matter, some mass forms Initially, it's very unusual kinds of matter, stuff that we are not familiar with, 
but that may be a big particle accelerator, like the one in Switzerland could produce. But after a few minutes, the particles are merging to make more recognizable things. And after a few minutes, we have the nuclei, the centers of hydrogen atoms and of helium atoms and some tiny amounts of heavy hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. I wonder if you use this phrase in Malaysia, the Goldilocks effect? Not heard it, no. I wonder if you know an English story for small children. Yes. Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Yes. yes, right, it comes from that. You know that in the story, the three bears go into Goldilocks's house. And Goldilocks is a small child and big bear, father bear and mother bear are too big. But for baby bear, things are just right. This Goldilocks effect is a phrase that scientists in Britain use to describe when conditions are just right for something to occur. And what I'm showing you on this slide is that between one second after the Big Bang and three minutes after the Big Bang, conditions were just right. Excuse me, I'm going to try and unhitch the microphone. Thank you. This means I can see the screen as well as you. So across here, we have time. Time going towards the present today. And in the other direction, back to the Big Bang. Here is one second after the Big Bang, and here is three minutes after the Big Bang. Before one second, the fireball was still hot and dense. And even when some particles formed, you couldn't get them joining together because when they banged into each other, which they did frequently, the particles disrupted the joining together of other particles. So you couldn't get particles joining together and staying joined together because it was too hot and too dense. After three minutes, we have a different problem. The expansion has continued, and now everything is too cold and too thin. Because it's cold, particles move slowly. And because it's thin, they do not often bump into other particles. So you cannot make bigger nuclei than hydrogen and helium because the particles never meet each other. So it is just within this short range, between one second and three minutes after the Big Bang, that we can get hydrogen and helium and a little bit of heavy hydrogen formed, but none of the heavier chemical elements. No carbon, no oxygen, no calcium, no iron, so no life just hydrogen and helium. And you cannot make life with just hydrogen and helium. So how do we get the other chemical elements that we have today? Where did they come from? The answer is, they came from the stars. This is just a little bit more about the very early universe. I mentioned we got the nuclei of hydrogen and helium atoms after a few thousand years, we get the electrons joining and making the full atoms. And after a while, the universe becomes transparent when the electrons join the nuclei to make atoms. But we still see some signs of that early universe from some of the ripples that there still are. Very, very shallow ripples, but they're still there. So, 
of the hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, calcium, iron, etc. that we need, we've only got hydrogen. So now to look at stars. Like human beings, stars are born, they live, and they die. But they take much longer than people. Our sun is a star, a very typical star. It has been shining for about five billion years, and will go on shining for about another five billion years. It's halfway through its life in some of the dark parts in our galaxy, in some of the dark clouds. And in those dark clouds, there are particles of dust and molecules of gas. And if by chance there is a little knot, a little condensation, like you see up here, here, this little knot has additional gravity. So it pulls in some of the surrounding particles, which makes the knot bigger, which puts up its gravity, which pulls in more particles. This shows you one of the places where star formation takes place, stellar nurseries. It's in dark areas like this, and in this lane, that you get star formation happening. This is part of the constellation of Orion. That's one of the stars in Orion's belt. And this is called the Horsehead Nebula because of this shape, which looks like the head of a horse. But actually, it is just uh, a shadow, a silhouette. It is some of this material from the dark cloud that is poking out. And behind it, there is pink glowing hydrogen. So in these dark areas, the stars initially form. As the knot grows, the temperature in its center rises because of the pressure of the overlying material. And when the temperature reaches about 10 million degrees Kelvin, nuclear reactions start. Nuclear fusion reactions. But I shall probably just talk about it as a burning. Our sun is using up hydrogen, a lot of hydrogen, 600 million tons every second. And it's been doing that for 5 billion years. It converts that hydrogen to helium. And in the process, there is some energy comes out. And that's the starlight. That's what makes the sun shine. And what makes most other stars shine as well. So it's the conversion of hydrogen to helium and giving energy. And once this nuclear reaction starts, we can see this because it is a shining star. It becomes visible. So this is another way of saying the same thing. Here in this dark area, there is the nuclear reaction and hydrogen is converting to helium. Outside that, there is hydrogen that is not yet touched, untouched hydrogen. This is a group of stars near constellation of Orion. We know of it in English as the Seven Sisters. The Greeks called it the Pleiades. Uh, these are very, very bright stars. Extremely luminous. Uh, yes, I know there are not seven of them, only five. I think some of them have dimmed since the ancient Arabs gave the name of the Seven Sisters. These stars are like young men and sports cars. The young man with the sports car is very bright, very flashy, very spectacular, but it doesn't last, and there's never any money in the bank. <laughs> These stars are very bright, very luminous, but they will only live a short time, and then they will have used up all their resources, and they have no money in the bank. So they will die young, these stars. They are actually quite young at the moment as well. They're less than 100 million years old. 
which is young by astronomical standards. But they will also die young. I wonder if you know this little verse. It contains some Scottish dialect, which you may not recognize. Ken. Ken means to know. Yeah, and you recognize the tune too. <laughs> Very good. It's based on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, the nursery run. to run out of hydrogen in its core. For the sun, this will be in about five billion years. For bigger stars, it will be sooner. But there will come a time when in the center of the star, there is a shortage of hydrogen because the hydrogen has been converted to helium. And the star has a problem. How can it continue to shine? For the sun and for most other stars, there will be one more short phase of life because the star can take the helium, which now is clogging up the core, and it can start converting the helium to carbon. So in the latter stages, and I think the colouring is not showing very well here, uh, in the centre of this there is a region where helium is being converted to carbon. Again, a nuclear reaction. Outside that, there is hydrogen converting to helium, and outside that, hydrogen that has not been touched. This is the first instance of carbon in the universe. This is the first mention of carbon. So far, we have only had hydrogen and helium, but here, in the very center of the star. Some carbon is being made. This is a group of stars near the south pole. I, you might be able to see it from Kuala Lumpur, I'm not quite sure. It's called the jewel box because many of the stars show colors. But stars do not show strong colours, just faint colours. So faint we may not be able to see it on this slide. But this star has a faint orange or red colour. It is a star that is getting towards the end of its life. We call it a red giant. And inside that star, helium is being converted to carbon. This is how the sun will age. When it gets to this stage of life, it will get cooler, so it will no longer be bright yellow, yellowy white, and it will go red or orange. It will also swell. It will swell and engulf the innermost planet. Can somebody tell me which is the innermost planet? Mercury. It will swell and engulf the next planet, which is Venus. What's the planet after that? Earth. It will swell, and either it just will, or just will not engulf the planet Earth. We can't do the sums accurately enough. But if the surface of the sun at a temperature of 3,000 degrees comes this close to Earth, I'm not staying. <laughs> Only I won't be here in five billion years, and I think you won't either. <laughs> However, if there is still intelligent life on Earth in five billion years, when the sun goes red and starts to swell, they know they have to move quickly. They have to send out the spaceships to explore, 
to find another star like our sun with a planet like the Earth, preferably uninhabited, and organize a mass migration by spaceship of all the people from Earth, taking with them, I suppose, the DNA for plants and animals, and taking with them food for a very long journey. The people who leave Earth will die on the spaceship. There will be some generations of people who only know life on the spaceship. And the people who arrive at the new Earth will not have known the old Earth. So they will have a tough job settling into the new place. So that's how our sun will progress and move into its old age. So now we have hydrogen and carbon, but it's inside the star. So that's not much use for us, for life. Not yet. After the sun has done the swelling up and engulfing planets, it goes through a variable phase. It gets a cough. <coughs> and one of its coughs is very big, and it, so to speak, breaks a rib. It sheds its outer layer. This material used to be the outer layer of that star. This star is nothing to do with the story. It just happens to be in the same direction. <laughs> it's probably at a different distance. But this is the core of the star, and this was its outer layer, and it's made of hydrogen. This core of the star is called a white dwarf, and there are no nuclear reactions there. There is no burning. There is no energy produced but it's still quite hot, so it's still shining, but cooling. And it will gradually cool from white hot to orange to red to brown and become invisible. So if there's any carbon, and there probably is, in the center of that star, it's locked in there and we can't get at it. However, for very big stars, like the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, they can go through many more stages, as well as burning hydrogen to make helium, and make burning helium to make carbon. They can burn carbon to make oxygen. And then when that process stops, they can burn the oxygen to make nitrogen. And then when that process stops, they can burn the nitrogen to make heavier chemical elements. And the star will gradually work through lots of different reactions. Um, and this shows you the different layers, like an onion, inside a massive star near the end of its life. You probably can't read this, I'm afraid. There's iron and nickel in the center, silicon and sulfur, nitrogen and oxygen, carbon, helium, and outside that, lots and lots and lots of hydrogen. When the star reaches this stage, and when its core becomes full of iron, and there doesn't seem to be anything left to burn, the star says, aha, I know what to do, because I've done it many, many times before. I will start burning the iron. I will start doing nuclear reactions with the iron. But actually, you can't do nuclear reactions with iron. Or more accurately, you cannot do nuclear reactions with iron and get some energy out. It absorbs energy. So this is like the bank manager saying he wants back the money he lent you. It's serious. The star tries to do nuclear reactions on the iron and it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks this bit of the star, but energy just gets absorbed and there is a spectacular outcome. Okay. So, in terms of the chemical elements we need, 
We've got hydrogen from the Big Bang, oxygen inside a big star, carbon inside a big star, calcium inside a big star, iron inside a big star, and probably also the trace elements we need, but they are still inside the star. This is a photograph of part of a nearby galaxy of stars that you can see in the southern skies with the naked eye. It's called the Large Magellanic Cloud. And it contains some hot glowing gas and many, many, many faint stars. And one here, identified with an arrow. Have you ever seen arrows in the sky? No. no. Somebody has, wow. See a specialist. <laughs> the arrow was added after the photograph was taken. <laughs> but watch that corner of the photograph. This is the inconspicuous star that we had to have labelled with an arrow. It has exploded. A huge explosion a catastrophic explosion that almost totally wipes out the star. But it's good news for us because in that explosion the carbon, the calcium, the oxygen, the iron, the gold, the nitrogen, the potassium, all those chemical elements get spread out into space and become more available. They're no longer locked inside a star. So we actually need the death of stars, the violent death of stars, to make available the chemicals that we need for life. This one is very hard to see, I'm sorry, and it's hard to photograph. There is a faint blue cloud here, a nebula, it's the remains of a star that exploded 950, 960 years ago, 955 years ago. And it's what's left of that explosion, a little bit of glowing debris. This is from a star that exploded 10,000 years ago, and the site of the explosion is probably somewhere away over here. And in the 10,000 years, the material thrown out into space has travelled this far. But it's still moving out, and with time will go further out, and will get thinner and less easy to see. But the material will still be there. The atoms will still be there. I wonder if you can also see a trail that goes from top left down to bottom right. There's an interesting comment to make here. In order to photograph the remains of the exploding star, we had the shutter on the camera open for 20 minutes. And during that 20 minutes, something flew across the picture, flew across the bit of sky we were photographing, and got captured along with all the images of the gas and the stars. It might have been a meteorite, it might have been an asteroid, it might have been an artificial satellite, satellite put up by humankind, but it's probably a piece of X satellite, a bit of metal from a satellite that has broken up. There are quite a lot of bits of metal up there in space making it a bit dangerous for astronauts and for other satellites. And the situation has got worse recently since a satellite was, since two satellites collided and broke up into many, many pieces. With time, these pieces come down lower and lower and enter the Earth's atmosphere and burn up. But until they do that, they are a real hazard and we have not been careful enough to keep space clean. So, the rest of this talk is in the form of a little mime, but I put up here the main conclusions. 
Could I have a bit more light, please? Is that possible? And I'm going to put down the microphone. So one of my first questions will be, can the back row hear me? Made of the same material. 
material, basically, as the sun. And in, these, in this disk, which is a bit like the rings of the planet Saturn, particles move around and bump into each other and stick together. And you get the planets made. The planets that are closest to the sun get a bit hot. And some of the lighter materials like hydrogen evaporate off. The planets further <coughs> out have a much bigger range of chemical elements. And so planets like Mercury, Venus, and Earth are made of the same stuff as the sun, but having lost some of the hydrogen and helium. Now, I am an astronomer, not a biologist, so I am not able to tell you how life came to be. But that life, when it did come to be, survived by, survived and grew by eating plants and other animals. And so it grew because it absorbed some of the atoms that other plants and animals had. And the plants get their atoms from the earth and maybe some water from the atmosphere. And the earth gets its atoms from the same place as the sun, which is inside, from the insides of two previous stars. So the atoms in your body, except for the hydrogen, the calcium in your bones, the carbon throughout your body, the oxygen in your lungs, the iron in your bloodstream, those atoms have been created inside big, massive stars and made available to us through the death of those stars, the explosive death of those stars. So we are dependent on the stars for our life. We are dependent on the death of stars for our life. And when we die, the atoms in our bodies will go back to the earth and will go round again. So in addition to being made of star stuff, maybe you have in you some atoms that were inside Einstein. It is possible. The odds are small, but it is possible. So if it wasn't for the stars, we would not be here. We are children of the stars. In an intimate and ultimate way, we are children of the stars. Indeed, I would say, you are stars. Thank you. We know what kind of atoms there are in stars by looking at the spectra of the stars, by studying the light, and splitting it up into its different colors. Each chemical element has its own fingerprint, its own pattern of spectral lines. So for instance, hydrogen often has a red color, oxygen often has a green color. So we can tell which chemicals we've got by studying the light that we get from a star. We can get the mass of a star if it's twinned with another star, what we call a binary system, they orbit each other. And from studying the orbit, you can get information on the masses of the stars. And that tells us how, how much material is in the star. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, to Malaysia, it has been an honor for us to have you today. I just want to ask one question, and I want you to give some of your experience in a, um, in your in your during your time when you're doing your PhD in Cambridge. Um, how do you discover Pasa? But my question is very simple. Um, the Big Bang. We're talking about the Big Bang, and then uh, if you look at the Big Bang, there's a cosmological principle behind the Big Bang. So the cosmological principle says it's homogeneous and isotropic. So, how, how does a Big Bang uh, actually happen? Does happen? If it happens as a point source, then it's violate the 
uh, homogeneous isotropic condition. Mm -hmm. So how do you describe a big bang uh, uh, phenomenon? Uh, and then, uh, then the second, uh, second one, I just like you to share your experience. How do you discover PASA in, in, in Cambridge University? Thank you. Thank you. That's about two more talks. <laughs> <laughs> the the Big Bang. The scientist believes that time, as the scientist understands time, began with the Big Bang. This is very convenient for scientists because it means we cannot answer questions about what was there before the Big Bang. If time starts with the Big Bang, the scientist cannot answer questions like before the start. It is not a question that makes scientific sense. A bit like saying, what is there north of the North Pole or south? of the South Pole. The question is out of context. So a scientist will not be able to tell you how the Big Bang started. There are other ways of addressing the question through religion, through art and music and literature and so on, but there is not a scientific way of addressing what there was before. Now, I think of the Big Bang as being like a leaf bud in springtime. The leaf bud bursts open and the leaf opens out. With the Big Bang, everything was folded up inside that tiny, tiny bud, that little ball, and space opened out. So space can, in fact, both be isotropic and homogeneous even when it's crinkled inside that little ball, that bud, and then opens out. Uh, that is, to say space is isotropic and homogeneous is actually an assumption. Uh, it seems to be a good one, but it, it's actually a human assumption, which we also need to remind ourselves. Um, I can't say much about the pulsars because if I start I will take an hour and a half. <laughs> but I will give just a little bit of background. When I was at school, at high school, I studied physics and maths, particularly. And in the British system, we specialize very early. So from about age 16, I only did physics and maths. And then I went to university in Glasgow and did a bachelor's degree in physics. After that, I went to another university, to Cambridge in England, to do a research degree, a doctorate, to work for my PhD. Maybe you've heard of some of these phrases. Uh, many people who work in universities have done that research degree and some school teachers have as well. To do this kind of research degree, which takes three or four years, you have a project, a big project, which lasts for the whole of those three or four years. And that is the only thing you do. And my particular project was to survey the sky, map the sky, looking for a new kind of object, an object that was new then, called quasars, which we know are very distant, very energetic, contain massive black holes, and are still a puzzle 40 years later. I use an analogy to describe what happened. Suppose there is a wonderful, beautiful sunset, and you are at some viewpoint and you're making a video of the sunset. And along comes a car and parks in front of you. And it has its yellow hazard warning lights going. I don't know what you would call them here. Do you recognize what I'm, yeah, okay. And it spoils your picture because all you can see is this. Well, for me, it was a bit like that. I was looking at quasars, looking for quasars which are very, very distant, 
and something in the foreground went woohoo, woohoo. <laughs> it wasn't perhaps that loud and clear, but it was through following up a curious signal that I wasn't particularly meant to follow up because it wasn't part of my project, but I followed it up and it turned out to be a new kind of star called a pulsar, um, which you get, let me see, I go forward a few slides. When a star explodes, like that star on the bottom right, the core of the star gets shrunk, collapsed, and this collapsed car star is called a pulsar or a neutron star. And that was what I had stumbled over. But please don't start a question with sorry. It's a very good question. Excellent. There used to be other theories beside the Big Bang. There used to be one which said there has never been a beginning. The universe has always been around. And as the galaxies move apart, left over from the Big Bang explosion, or whatever, as the galaxies move apart, new galaxies appear to fill the gaps. That theory was called steady state, or sometimes continuous creation. But the evidence now has accumulated which says that theory cannot be right. It has to be a big bang. And the evidence, um, I've mentioned one or two bits, so I'll just mention them all. Um, I've alluded to the fact that space is still expanding and the galaxies are moving apart. Everything is moving apart. And that's a residue of that explosion. We also know from the amount of deuterium in the atmosphere, in the atmosphere, in the universe, that there must have been a big bang of the kind we envisage. If things were very different, we would have either no deuterium or tons more deuterium. And the third evidence, piece of evidence is that there is still what's sometimes called an echo of the big bang. If you have an old-style television set where you tune between the stations with a knob, not the push-button kind, but one where you tune, when you are between stations, you get a hiss. About 10% of that is actually cosmic from outer space. And it's a very weak radio signal. It's the heat of the Big Bang now much more diluted and thinned out, but still there. It's called the cosmic microwave background, and they study that a lot. So those three lines of evidence suggest that the Big Bang is the right theory, and that the steady state or continuous creation theory just won't fit the data, can't work. <coughs> Things in the disc bumped into each other and made bigger disks. Uh, in the very early stages of the planets, there were still lots of other rocks and things rattling around. So it was quite dangerous. There were a lot of collisions. And something quite big, not as big as Mars, but quite big, bumped into the Earth. And the moon was the material that got kicked off broken off the Earth by that collision. So the Moon is largely made of material from the Earth's surface. And uh, during the early stage of the solar system, it was created from the, from the Earth, as best we understand. Hello. Okay, my name is Saif uh, For your permission, I'm a postgrad in a radio astronomer. Since you are the radio astronomer, I'm very interested about your your fast detections, and I have a little lot, uh, I have uh, read a lot about your experience for detecting fast You do using uh, some materials and also uh, some techniques. 
But my question is, uh, since uh, radio astronomy begin at uh, 1934, they use the radio telescope to detect some of the the, the source. But uh, from what I read, you have to use the some uh, infrared, right? You use the dipole to detect the, the pulsar. Okay, why you don't use the radio as uh, radio telescope, and uh, how you get uh, the ideas to use the, the kind of the lot of the dipole as the infrared infrared to detection uh, the, the pulsar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The telescope I was using when I was a graduate student was a radio telescope. So it was receiving radio waves from stars and galaxies and quasars in particular. One of the techniques used by radio astronomers is to use a pair of telescopes called an interferometer. And this gives you a more narrow you look at a smaller patch of sky. So it's easier to sort out what is going on. And that was the technique that we were using. It was an interferometer with many, many dipoles. Uh, you would get the same effect if you took some of the very old fashioned TV aerials, um, connected together about 2,000 of them, uh, and did them in two parts electrically. So that's basically what we were doing. Okay, um, we all know the beginning of the universe, so how does the universe end? Does the universe end. die? <laughs> does the universe die? <laughs> Another very good question, thank you. Yes. The news is not good, I'm afraid. The news, in fact, is very bad. At the moment, we have the galaxies with stars shining. And the galaxies are each moving apart from each other. But because of what I was explaining this morning, in each of those galaxies, some of the hydrogen is being used up and is being turned into carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, calcium. Da -da 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 -da. So in each galaxy, there's a greater range of chemicals, but it's at the expense of the original hydrogen. Stars go out, new stars light. Except there will come a time when old stars go out and new stars do not light because there is not enough hydrogen around. The new star does not contain enough hydrogen to start shining. And so the galaxies gradually go dark. The lights go out. The black holes that there are at the center of most galaxies will have a great time. They will continue to grab and swallow anything that comes too close, but the galaxies will go dark. The other very recent thing we have found is that the expansion of the universe is getting faster. You would expect it gradually to slow because of gravity, but it's not, it's getting faster. And galaxies gradually will disappear from our view because of this faster and faster speed. And so what will end up is a black hole where our galaxy used to be, marking the site of our galaxy. And there's nothing else. So humankind, life will be killed in the very long term in the universe. It is hostile to life, which is why I say the news is not good. So be a black hole. They have a much better future than humankind. Yeah, you have this Godzilla effect in the middle. Yeah, there's something happening immediately after one second, and then something after two minutes. So how do you arrive at this? Time three. One second which is very small and three minutes. These are time you know small small times. So how do you track this? And another one is as you say, is the whole world, the whole universe started with a big bang. Where is the that particular size in space? The actual position. 
Is it possible to do it in the toilet? Okay, let's deal with this one first, which I think was the first half of your question. We were not there. We were not around at one second after the Big Bang. We were not around at three minutes after the Big Bang. So this is done with physics and mathematics, modeling, the theory, working backwards, starting with today and the galaxies moving apart, asking what happened before that and before that and before that and before that. And it's using very extreme physics but some of the big particle accelerators, like the one in Geneva, Switzerland, gives us some data, and that has helped build this picture. But it is a theoretical picture. Um, where was the Big Bang? One of the things that is disguised or packed into the sentence on that slide is that all of space was inside that tiny, tiny ball. All of space, like a leaf inside a bud, was crinkled up inside this tiny, tiny space. And that space exploded, so the explosion involved all of space that was crinkled up inside the tiny, tiny bud. So the explosion was actually everywhere because all of space was involved in the explosion. And even though it looks to us as if we might be the center, because every galaxy is moving away from us, in fact, if we lived in a different galaxy, we would still see every galaxy moving away from us due to the expansion. So the official answer, and I know it's hard to get one's head around this, the official answer was the explosion was everywhere in all of space. It had no particular centre. Do you require I think I need to explain both briefly dark energy and dark matter. I was saying a minute or two ago about how the expansion of the universe is getting faster, accelerating, there seems to be some anti-gravity. Something is pushing things apart. We call that dark energy. And although we have given it a name, we understand very, very little about it so far. It's a fairly new discovery. But the thing that's pushing the expansion of the universe is called dark energy. Now, very confusingly, we also have something called dark matter. We know a bit more about this, but still not an awful lot. You've probably seen pictures of galaxies, spiral galaxies. They spin, they rotate. And if you study them carefully, you find that these spinning galaxies are spinning so fast, they ought to fly apart, centrifuge apart. And yet we see no spiral galaxy flying apart. It holds together. The only way it can hold together is if there is extra material which does not shine, provides gravity but does not shine. And we call that dark matter. Now to get to your question, we are not quite sure whether the dark matter gets involved in the formation of stars or whether you find it inside stars as well as everywhere else. We have no proof of that yet, but it's one of the things we are researching. So I think at the moment I can't give you an answer to that except to say it's another very good question and we are trying to find the answer. Assuming we fast forward 5 billion years and you say the sun will just die off, okay. And that should be an early sign of apocalypse. So has any researchers find a new destination for mass migration for man? No, not yet, but we're looking. 
One of the fascinating research programs at the moment is looking for planets round other stars. And they're suddenly beginning to find a lot of them. At the, I think maybe I'll do a demonstration and I'll put the microphone down. So if the back row cannot hear me, will you shout at me, please? <laughs> planets going round the star. Do you see that the, plant, the star is moving a little bit? Yes. Yeah. That happens in real life. And what we look for is a star that's doing this. We cannot see the individual planets, but if you see a star doing this, you suspect a planet. Now this effect is strongest when you have a heavy planet close in, because there's more gravity between them. And so far, we're only finding stars that have heavy planets, like Jupiter, close in. We haven't yet got the technique to find the effects of smaller planets further out. So we have not yet found a planet like the Earth at the Earth's distance from another star. But the techniques are rapidly getting better and soon we will be able to. But already we know of about two or three hundred cases of planets like Jupiter going around close to their sun. Hot Jupiters, they're called. Raises interesting questions about why is Jupiter-like planet so close to the star? Lots of interesting questions when you do research. But I think soon we will be finding Earth-like planets around stars like the sun. Give us another five years, ten years, and I think we will. Good morning, Bob. Uh, I'm Madhu from South Mayo. So you have mentioned about the expansion of the universe, and you you mentioned that the the, the expansions now is a bit accelerating. Um, what actually drive the expansion of the universe? Is that because of the nature of the explosion, or other causes that? added to the acceleration of the expense. Thank you. We don't yet have a full answer to that question. But certainly some of the expansion is just the momentum left over from the initial explosion. That's clear. But that expansion should not be accelerating. So there must be something else as well, adding a push to the galaxies. We've only, no, let me start that sentence again. This pushing effect only shows in the relatively recent universe, not in the more distant, the further back in time. And one of the questions we have to answer is, was that pushing always there, just masked, hidden by other effects previously, or has it just recently started? And another question we have to answer is, is it the same everywhere? That's the word isotropic that you were using, sir. And we don't yet know whether it's the same everywhere. So we've got to do a lot more work on what this extra push causing the acceleration is. And it's one of the very live areas of research in astrophysics these days. A lot of people really fascinated by this. But for now, I don't have a fuller answer than that, I'm afraid. Yes, sir. Um, can you please explain something about uh, inflation? Right. <laughs> <laughs> One of the curiosities about the universe is if you look very far away in that direction, you see galaxies and things and you can measure some of the properties of that part of the universe. If you look very far in that direction, you see galaxies and things, and you can measure some of the properties of the universe. And it turns out that the universe there has the same properties as the universe there. The snag is 
That lot is 12 billion year light years away, and that lot is 12 billion light years away. So there could have been no communication between those two during the life of the universe, because they're 24 billion light years apart. So to try and explain why opposite sides of the universe look so very, very similar, disturbingly similar, in fact, what they think happened was shortly after the Big Bang, everything was very close together, obviously. And then there was this period of very rapid expansion, which they call inflation, which meant things got much further apart than you might suspect. But they were originally neighbors. And they knew about what the neighbors were doing. And they shared the physics and they, did, they turned out the same way. No, they are very, very far apart because of this early rapid expansion that they call inflation. Inflation has really been invented to explain something we see observationally. Um, it may be connected with the, the four fundamental forces and how they divided out in the early universe. But I think it's still not clear, particularly what stopped inflation. I think we maybe have some idea what started this rapid expansion. I don't know how it stopped. But that's broadly what inflation is, invented to explain the similarity of distant parts of the universe. Can it? Can it why can't it still exist in black hole? Galaxies. Yeah, black holes have very strong gravity and will pull into them anything that gets too close. And that might be spaceships or planets or gas or other galaxies or whatever. When something goes into a black hole, it gets squashed and squashed and squashed. Indeed, squashed out of recognition, squashed almost out of existence. And so if a galaxy does merge, fall into a black hole, it is going to be so squashed, you would no longer call it a galaxy. It probably still does not have atoms in it. Even the atoms are squashed. So keep clear of black holes.